I'm gonna go ahead and get started, and I have to apologize. My uh, voice is a little scratchy. Usually it's not at this point by the beginning of the conference, but I went to a concert, so choices were made. Um, okay, so hopefully you're in the right spot. Um, we're gonna be talking about like what's new with Flux. We'll also be discussing what's upcoming in the next quarters. I am Priyanka Ravi. I also go by Pinky. I am a platform technology technical advocate at um, G Research. And um, I'm a Flux project maintainer and an advocate for GitOps. And um, I also, before this, was a developer experience engineer at Weaveworks for two years. And before that, I was at State Farm and I helped um, start the GitOps process at the company, create the GitOps process at the company more like. So that's, um, I have end user experience with Flux. Um, that's how I kind of became involved and then ended up at Weaveworks. And for the last two years, I've been helping people with their journeys with the project. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start with like, what is Flux just in case anyone's new here and they haven't um, had any experience with it. And um, Flux is a Git-centric package manager for your applications, and it's a set of continuous and progressive delivery solutions for Kubernetes. It's not technically limited to Kubernetes. It can manage things outside of Kubernetes as well, but that's, that's what we'll be focusing on. Um, so what are the benefits of Flux? Flux allows you to um, reduce developer burden. You don't have to be at work on a weekend dealing with you know, some manual deployment process. It, everything's um, done through uh, process, um, automated processes. It's also extensible. It's very modular and lightweight, so you can kind of pick and choose the experience you want with it. Um, it also comes with out-of-the-box support for customize and Helm, and it was designed for Kubernetes completely, so it works with pretty much any setup you already have. It's just kind of a drop-in thing. So Flux is a set of Kubernetes controllers. If you're not familiar with controllers in Kubernetes, they manage the life cycle of objects, um, such as creation, deletion, um, updates, things like that. Uh, these are the, the um, controllers that are found within it. So there's the source controller, which listens for a source and then um, pulls in. So like your Git repo is an example, or an OCI registry, or a um, uh, S3 bucket, whatever. And it will pull in the manifest there from there, everything that's from there. And then the customized controller will go in. And if you're using customization YAMLs, if you're using just vanilla YAMLs, the customized controller will be activated and it'll actually um, apply what's there. So if you have a customization.yaml, it will follow that blueprint and apply what's there. If you don't, it will um, create a customization.yaml basically in the back end and apply everything recursively that it finds within that full file path. So whatever file path you give it, it'll find every YAML and it'll apply it. Um, and then the Helm controller then looks for Helm releases and it will actually install Helm um, charts and it is using the true Helm API. So it will, um, you can use the Helm CLI to interact with things that are deployed using Flux. Um, and then the Tofu controller is not an official, you won't find it on the Flux uh, 2 project page. It's recently renamed from the Terraform controller. Um, and it allows you to manage either Tofu resources, open Tofu resources, or um, Terraform resources as well, which is kind of why I gave the caveat that it's not all limited to Kubernetes. You can deploy anything anywhere. Um, and then there's the notification controller, which handles inbound and outbound traffic. It can send notifications to Slack, for instance, if something's down, or if you know a release just happened and it can notify you in Slack. It can also um, listen for webhooks from things like GitHub, GitLab. It can listen for a web webhook event when a merge is actually made and then kick off a, um, a reconciliation. So instead of having to wait your reconciliation interval, which might be like five minutes, 10 minutes, it can just automatically kick off that, that um, reconciliation. So then we have the image reflector and automation controller. So these controllers can work together to update your um, update based on a new image tag. So if it's listening to an image repository and you create it, you push a new tag, it can update your YAML to the new version and then all, the whole process will repeat itself and it'll actually deploy it as well. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so um, now let's talk about Flux 2.2.0. So it was a major breakthrough for the Flux team. 
Um, we managed to solve many issues around Helm operations, and um, it is the first release that comes with official benchmarking as well. And um, so we have a benchmark set on GitHub, which is public, and it's um, the project is actually flux-benchmark, if you want to go check it out on GitHub. And um, we're taking advantage of the GitHub enterprise runners that um, were awarded, that the CNCF awarded to the Flux project. And um, so we can run these benchmarks for Flux with um, huge machines where there's a lot of power, which is really cool. And so starting with this version, 2.2, we um, publish benchmarks for each minor release. And these releases happen at least like three times per year. Um, so usually after each like Kubernetes minor, um, and there's already been a few patches since. Um, and uh, so the benchmark work is trying to measure the mean time to production. Um, it's a measurement of two types of operations, source acquiring, so how long does Flux take connecting to a container registry and pulling from there either Flux OCI artifacts or Helm charts, also our OCI artifacts. And it does reruns of this benchmark with 100 Helm releases, a um, hundred, a hundred Helm charts, a hundred Flux artifacts, and then it switches to 500, and then it does a thousand as well. So um, the idea behind these benchmarks is that we want to see what happens when someone has a huge cluster with potentially tens of thousands of apps, and we have users which are doing many large parallel deployments, and we wanted to push Flux really hard to say how fast can it actually deliver a thousand new Helm charts from the registry up to the Helm release install and upgrade in the cluster. So we measure the time it takes Flux to acquire the sources, verify them, and the time it takes to reconcile it in the cluster state and deploy them. And the results have been really, really good. Um, there are some really huge improvements that have been made to the Helm controller, especially to achieve these kind of numbers. Um, and the customized controller was already doing pretty good even before, um, but there were some like, we did find some major issues in terms of memory usage. Um, and we shipped in 2.2 an optimization where the customized controller can basically do all of that with 100 megabytes of memory instead of like two or three gigabytes that it would have needed before. And um, also the Helm controller is now under one gigabyte for a thousand Helm upgrades in parallel as well. So in terms of performance, Flux is in a really, really great place with 2.2. The need for sharding is less and less of an issue right now. Um, sharding is more now about multi-tenancy isolation. So if you don't trust Kubernetes RBAC and things like that, um, but a single Flux instance can now deal with tens of thousands of apps on a single cluster. So we're very excited about that. Um, in the Helm controller, besides improving how Helm operations are made and making huge optimizations to the Helm SDK in terms of memory usage, we also solved some long-standing issues that were quite impactful, especially at scale. So when you have many, many clusters or many releases. Um, there was a situation, for example, if the node, um, if the node where the Helm controller was running was crashing, then the Helm, when the, while the Helm controller was performing an upgrade, then that particular Helm controller or Helm releases would have just been stuck forever. You had to go on the cluster and do some manual operations like deleting the Helm storage or deleting the release, or I'm sure many of y'all have done this, like suspending and unsuspending and all things like that. So in 2.2, when Helm controller actually recovers, it um, spins up a new node or whatever is happening to it, and then it detects all the Helm releases which are left in a locked state. And it unlocks them, and according to the specification you've set, um, let's say the Helm release has retries enabled or continuously upgrade or whatever, it will actually do what it's supposed to do, so it can automatically recover any Helm releases from any state. Um, also, even if people are running Helm commands like Helm upgrade um, in parallel with the Helm controller, uh, which would have in the past you know, got the release in a very bad state, um, now the Helm controller can detect that and it will undo it and move forward with like a proper upgrade. Um, it's been tested in a lot of different situations and we're pretty confident that um, it you don't need to do any manual intervention hopefully in these situations anymore. It can do it automatically. And this was a big thing <laughs> that was asked for a lot. So really excited about that being fixed. 
Um, another improvement around, around Helm is that now you can enable drift detection and um, optionally correction on per Helm release basis. So now in the Helm release version, um, V2, I, think, I don't know if it's still this version, um, V2 beta 2 API, it might've switched. Um, you have an optional field where you can say like, yes, I want to enable drift detection. And you can now ignore like rules for certain fields as well. So basically the gist of this is that um, if you have something in your Helm chart that deploys things, then there is a controller or something else which modifies some fields. So um, what the Helm controller does if drift detection is enabled is it will roll back those changes immediately. And for some things, um, you may not want to do that. So just a heads up that that's like a feature that's like addable, but you might not always want to do that. Um, for charts with lifecycle hooks or cluster resources like horizontal or vertical pod autoscalers, um, for which controllers may write updates back into their own spec, those updates would always be considered as drift by the Helm controller unless the source was ignored in full. So that's like a case where yeah, you want to be careful. Um, so for those type of situations, you can actually tell the Helm controller to ignore certain fields. And you can say that like target, I think it was deployment.spec.replica, and you can set that to ignore, and it will just skip that field. Um, and that doesn't mean that if you do an upgrade of the chart that that field will be ignored. That's not what it's saying. But because we have no control over the upgrade procedure, um, because it's done by the Helm SDK, um, and it's done in the same manner, basically, that you would do when you do a Helm upgrade on the CLI. Um, another thing that we've been fighting with is that Helm does not know how to patch custom resources. So if you have a custom resource in your Helm chart, what Helm does with it is if you update it in the cluster, uh, it'll skip it. If you update in the Helm chart, it will override the whole thing. Um, so when we saw a drift detection, we couldn't actually run a Helm upgrade. So instead of doing that, the Helm controller runs the drift detection, uh, drift correction in the same uh, manner as the customized controller um, does with server-side apply. Um, and all the cool things like um, that is developed in Flux. So the drift detection is a really solid implementation um, and solution that we have today. Lots of people have been waiting like two or three years for this change, so we're really excited about that, um, being able to deliver that as well. Um, other things that were shipped in 2.2 um, include an improvement to running jobs with Flux customization. So we have a way of doing pre-deployment jobs and post-deployment jobs with Flux with no Helm, just pure customized NEMLs. Um, there is a guide on that, actually, if you're looking for it. And it, all of these, these things are actually mentioned in a really great blog that was written by Hida. Um, and so you can check that out in the fluxcd.io um, docs. Uh, if you go there, you can check out the blog. Um, and so basically, um, there, there was a lot of issues where if you, for example, if you had a database, database migration, then you deploy your app, then you run tests and like so on. Um, the deployment, the issue was with this, like, I'm trying to remember what I'm trying to say. Sorry, I got lost in my own thoughts. Um, okay, so let me start over with that, sorry. Um, a lot of people have been using it, like, so the customized, um, the customized controller, for example, is to do database migration. So if they deploy their app, then they run the tests and so on. They basically, you have directories that are left with no jobs that are doing stuff before the deployment, the deployment, and then after the deployment. Um, and they, so the, it, the jobs that are doing stuff before the deployment, they end up getting left. It leaves a bunch of pods behind is what I'm trying to say, sorry. Um, and they are not running, but they can build up if you have like tens of thousands of releases, right? They can build up and they end up just being there and they're no longer there um, in etcd. And then um, you need to run like a different job to do the cleanup. And in the past, um, Flux wouldn't have either done that. And so what we've shipped in this version is actually an improvement to the Flux customized controller garbage collection, which, um, so now the garbage collector actually um, detects that it has deleted the job. And then, um, and that the, like Kubernetes has left all these, these um, pods in there and it goes and cleans them up on its own. So it's a good improvement for those that are not relying on Helm to run all of these things. Um, they just wanna deal with YAMLs and not mess with Helm, but they don't want all these this trash laying around. Um, another improvement is a feature where the customized controller um, can now restore the cluster state after you do edits on the cluster, 
with something else other than cube control. So this was an issue before. And so like the thing being fixed is like if you use Lens as an editor um, and you mess up your production cluster, sadly Lens does not act as cube control. So it has its own manager name and you can mess up the cluster very, very badly. Um, and the problem was that Flux would not undo these changes. It will just merge the git state with whatever you did in Lens. And it just makes a huge mess. Um, and you'll have no idea what changes went where and so on. And um, so now you have, like, we now have a new flag in the customized controller. And when you, um, as a cluster admin, when you install it, you can configure there the actual Lens field manager name. Um, you can set field managers that are disallowed from making changes on the cluster. And what will happen is like now by default, Flux undoes all the cube control edits. And it will also do the same stuff with edits made by Lens or K9s or any other editor that you're using. Um, the only thing is that you need to figure out what the field manager is. And you just have to configure Flux to do that. Um, other major improvements have been made around integration with Cosign. For the OCI repository and Helm charts, there was um, a talk at KubeCon actually about this as well. Not the last KubeCon, the KubeCon before that. Um, and that feature is about the possibility of verifying the identity of the keyless signatures when Flux pulls these artifacts from the container registry. So now you can say, not only I want the Helm chart to be signed, you can actually say, um, I want the Helm chart to be signed by this authority from this repo by this GitHub action. And it allows you to do very strict policies on what entities allow your um, allow you allow to change your cluster state. And um, so now we got cosine keyless signature on pair with OpenPGP, where you can actually specify exact identities when you use the verification. And there are two optional fields in the OCI repository, and the um, and the Helm chart template, which is called match OIDC identity. It has a subject and an issuer, and you can write a regex ex expression, or you can put the whole string of the subject and issuer to verify that as well. Um, we uh, now have Flux Bootstrap command, which works with Gitea servers, self-hosted or the hosted version. It has full coverage in, Git now, uh, in Flux now. <laughs> um, it can do bootstrap. It can also do web hooks for Gitea. It can also have receivers and so on. It has full support in the same way we have for GitHub and GitLab. We have also completed the Bitbucket server and data center implementation. So Flux Bootstrap knows how to do that for Bitbucket data center. But we didn't have support for commit status updates. We had it only for Bitbucket Cloud. So now we have finalized the data center and server implementation. And we can also do commit status updates from the notification controller as well. And um, we've also added safeguards to both Flux install and Flux upgrade. So now if you try to do a Flux install over a cluster that is already bootstrapped, the Flux install command will halt and verify that you really want to do this. Um, you, like it'll tell you you have already bootstrapped and this is the version and so on. So it prevents any accidents that would mess up the cluster. Um, another thing is when you do flux version or flux check on the CLI, we now show you the version installed on the cluster and we tell you if the cluster was bootstrapped or not. That was an issue that some people were having. Um, Another thing on the Flux CLI around Helm releases, if you change something in the Helm release in the values of the Helm release, the Helm controller does the upgrade, the upgrade actually fails. Um, the changes that you did are wrong or the Helm chart is not backwards compatible and it fails. Um, there was no way of retrying that operation before in those situations. So um, unless you went to Git and like actually changed some values and forced it, um, the Helm release, you know, it, it can fail for due to various reasons. So, um, such as maybe you didn't have enough capacity in your cluster for the rollout to actually happen. You'll see the Helm controller that fails um, and sets the Helm release to a failed state. And even if the capacity is increased, there was no way of telling it to retry um, without changing the configuration in Git. <laughs> And so we have added a CLI command and an annotation. So you can, um, so you can do it both via the C Flux CLI or directly in Git by adding the notation to the Helm, con Helm release. No changes in the values are of the chart itself. And um, we actually have two flags, Flux reconcile um, Helm release dash dash force. And what force will do in that case 
is um, annotate the Helm release, which tells the Helm controller, even if it failed, even if it um, reached max retries, try it one more time. In the Helm release, you have retries also that tell the Helm controller how many times it should retry that operation. And so let's say you have set the retries to three and, it, and usually it works, but for some reason it got to the maximum retries and it can't move forward for some reason. Um, and something happens to your cluster and you wish to reset those um, retries without changing the configuration again. We also now have a dash dash reset flag for the reconcile, reconcile command which sets an annotation again, so it can also be done through Git, which tells the Helm controller to reset the count to zero and do all the retries again. There's a lot more changes in this version. I tried to pick the ones that I think are the most exciting, um, but like I said, you can go read that blog post by Hida as well and get more information. Um, briefly, I'm gonna talk about what's coming up in the roadmap for 2024. Um, for the first two quarters, um, the first priority is general availability. So we're graduating almost 80% of the Flux APIs to GA. That's the goal. And for now, um, there's only a few uh, in GA, such as like the Git repo customization and receiver. And um, this year, we're promoting all the Helm constructs to GP GA, um, which means we basically are telling you that we're not going to break anything. We've been good about this in the past, always backwards compatible and stuff like that. But you know, now we're promising that that's not going to happen. Um, and we're also doing the same thing for the image automation resources as well. Yeah. Another thing um, that we're doing is, um, aside from GA, is adding features to Flux. That's another focus. Um, we do have an RFC process in place, and we're encouraging people who want to add these features to Flux to also help maintain them in the long run, because it's a lot um, to have to add these features and then know that we're all going to be maintaining it in the future as well. Um, so the first one is we're going to be shipping a um, notary integration in the next Flux version. We already have Cosign um, uh, integration, but if you've seen the Bitnami announcement that happened, all Bitnami charts in Docker Hub are now signed with Notation. So Notation is becoming so popular that Flux should definitely be able to work with it. Um, so a big thanks to Microsoft for contributing this feature. Um, and it's been a long journey. They did have some issues and there was some refactoring, a lot of refactoring that needed to happen. But um, this should be available in the next release. Um, another thing that is happening is that the people from Ericsson, um, together with the CDF organization, they had a lot of um, use cases for Flux and they wanted it better integrated with Tekton. So they are contributing the CD events integration um, in the next release. Um, so basically we're going to allow for Flux to react to CD events. Um, for example, Tekton does something like creates an OCI artifact that it can tell Flux to reconcile it by sending in a CD event to the Flux notification controller. So we are extending the receiver with CD events and later on we want to make Flux translate all the Flux events into CD events. So then Flux can tell Tekton, hey, I deployed that. Um, now you run the end-to-end -end test or something, and then you can call me back and I'm you know, doing something else. Um, CD events is very nice for being able to mix together different components of your platforms. And we are very thankful to Ericsson for doing all this work. Um, other things that we are moving forward with um, is Helm OCI improvements. We're going to allow a Helm release to reference an OCI repository. So we're expanding beyond what the Helm, what Helm, the CLI, and the SDK can do as well. You'll be able to pin a Helm chart by its OCI digest. So even if a tag is not reliable, you'll be able to, you know, people can override them and, and things like that. You'll be able to use the OCI digest for that. Another interesting thing people have asked was being able to deploy on staging only release candidates of their Helm charts. So they don't want to, they don't want the stable releases um, in their, uh, in their um, staging clusters. They only want it in the production clusters. And Semver doesn't allow you to do that. So if you write a Semver range, you can't say only pre-releases. So we are also adding this feature where you can filter 
um, the regex with versions where we apply the Sember ranges. So in the future, you can say like dash RC goes to staging, and if it's dash test, it goes to the testing cluster and so on. It basically gives you the power on, more power on how you can um, do things with Helm and direct Helm automated upgrades. And yeah, and big thanks to Sula from Control Plane um, for contributing the um, Helm OCI uh, enhancements there as well. All right, so I hit on this briefly a, sec, uh, a bit ago, but I did want to mention like a couple of other things that are in the Flux ecosystem, maybe a little newer. Um, so the first one is the Tofu controller, which was you know previously known as the Weave TF controller. It's a controller um, for Flux to reconcile open Tofu and Terraform resources in the um, GitOps way. So it's still using like the whole Flux process. And so with the power of Flux together with Open Tofu and Terraform, the Tofu controller allows you to GitOpsify infrastructure and application resources in the Kubernetes and ISC universe at your own pace. So you can manage things that are even outside of Kubernetes. Obviously, it has to be running. The, the controller runs in Kubernetes, but you can have it stand up things outside of Kubernetes as well, which is pretty neat. And then another thing I wanted to mention is also um, capacitor. So it's a uh, GUI that uh, acts as a dashboard for Flux where you can get quick overview about your Flux resources and application deployments to debug things very quickly. It's a, a pretty cool UI. I included the link here as well if anyone's interested in checking that out. Um, and there's also like a whole blog post on that as well on our docs that you can go check out. Um, so I wanted to leave with this. Um, we really want to strive to make Flux sustainable. You know, things have happened recently that were a little hard for our, our community. And so we really want to invite the community to help us shape the future of Flux. Um, we, like I mentioned, we have in place um, the, an RFC proposal process for new features and enhancements. Um, we're very keen to work with the community on RFCs and dive, you know, drive the project forward in a sustainable manner. manner. Um, like I said, we're really inviting people if they have like a, an RFC to then also help maintain it and then they can become maintainers on that, that um, controller. And they don't have to worry about maintaining the whole thing because being a maintainer on a project is really intimidating, but it would be cool if they could like help maintain that feature and, you know, um, support for it as well. We want to enable community members to take full ownership of Flux features and share the responsibility of Flux, of feature stability um, and longer term management as well, maintenance and management. Yeah, so that's what we're hoping for in our future. And um, yeah, you can also go there and check that out as well. 